And as we turn to chapter 13, we all are going to chuckle to ourselves and think, wow, God has a sense of humor that yesterday was the New Hampshire primary. Uh, this is an election year. And the topic before us today, as you well know, is submitting to your governing authorities. Thinking, wow, God knew how to time that one well. Uh, so obviously we didn't plan it this way. We just started the Romans Bible study two years ago, and lo and behold, here we are at a very important passage uh, at a very important time in at least our nation's history. And so this is going to be relevant on all kinds of levels. Now, one of the things when you think about a, a passage on government, you think Paul's going to tell me you know, all the ins and outs of how to think about politics. That's not what Paul's doing here. Paul's point is actually much more basic than that. And one that sometimes we need to hear and sometimes we don't realize we need to hear is that you just need to submit to your government even if you don't happen to like it. And so this is going to be a challenging text for us today. So I'm excited, and there's a lot of interesting little angles to this. So let's read it. We're in chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, a, I think a manageable size passage compared to some of the others Paul puts in front of us. And uh, we'll see how far we can get here. So let's listen to what God has to say to us. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad or do you have no fear of the one who's in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes." For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. That's a timely text. That's a hard text too, isn't it? Let's pray and ask God to bless us as we dive into that today. Let's pray. Lord, we confess that we understand what this text says, but we don't necessarily want to do what this text says. This is in some ways a hard teaching, but Lord, help us see today that when we submit to human authorities, that really that's just a, a reflection of how we also submit to you as our ultimate divine authority. I pray you bless our time now in Christ's name. Amen. Paul uses a word here today that may be the most unpopular word in our entire culture. It's a word that we don't even like, if we're honest. I mean, think about it. It's one thing to find a word that our culture doesn't like, but if you find a word that our culture doesn't like, and even Christians struggle with this particular word, that tells you something about the hearts of human beings. And that word, of course, as we all know, is the word submission. Submission is not a word that anyone likes to talk about. In fact, when you think about our world and what they think about submission, I imagine all kinds of things pop into our head here, and I want to start us off with that opening question is, what does our world think about that awful, terrible thing called submission, which Paul is going to turn around and say, actually, it's a very good thing, even though you, you buck up against it. Let's start with this very obvious question this morning. What does our world think about the term submission? Leave aside who you're submitting to for the moment. Just think about the term for a moment. What's our world have to say about it? What's that? Ignorant? Okay, anybody who submits is just putting their head in the sand. They're acting in an ignorant fashion. Right. Here's the thing that you hear all the time is that, you know, you have rights. Fight for your rights. Stand up for things. Submission, in many people's minds, is the opposite of that, so people don't like it. Yep. Oh, that's a good one, right? Old-fashioned. You know, submit? What, what are you living in, like, like the 1920s, right? Actually, that's not a good decade for that, now that I think about it. Uh, 1950s? <laughs> Uh, you know, what, 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 your, 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 you know, yesteryear, okay, good, yes, okay, they're saying, uh, you're sort of meek, and although that's a good quality, ironically, the Bible lays out, what other thoughts come to mind, yes, okay, 
if you submit to somebody, you're just, you're just allowing them to run you over, right? Submission is just you being a doormat. If you let someone, if you submit to somebody, you're not standing up for yourself, right? Come on, you can't do that. Here's what's interesting about not only our American culture, but truthfully the human heart, is a human heart is a heart that wants no one and nothing to ever rule over it. Think about it for a moment. We're in our own hearts, if we're honest. Even as believers, we have the sense of, you know something? Don't you ever tell me what to do. You don't ever rule over me. I'm my own boss. I'm not going to submit to anybody. Uh, no one, you know, can rule over me. And there's this sort of defiant fist in the air type attitude that we all inherently have just as sinful, fallen human beings. And what's ironic is that when we have that attitude as believers, we shake our fists at every authority in the world and say, oh, but God, he's fine. I'll submit to him. But no one else, no one else counts as someone I should submit to. And here's what Paul's going to do today. He says, you know, it doesn't quite work that way. Why should you think you would submit to God so easily when every authority he's put over you, you reject? You're going to reject all the God-given authorities and suddenly you submit to God? No, here's the thing. Paul's going to lay out a principle and I'm betting that most of us probably haven't thought about this. Paul's going to lay out a principle today that one of the hallmark characteristics of believers is that they are submissive. Okay? Now, I'm going to define that in a hundred ways and clarify that. I know you have all your questions. But that is one of the hallmark characteristics of what counts as someone who's a Christian, is that they should be marked by a submissive spirit. Not just to God. By the way, this is all believers, right? Every single one of us that we should not only be submissive to God, but to whatever proper authority God puts over us, okay? And there's lots of them. Now, Paul's going to pick just one today, government. But as you'll see as we go along, that's not the only authority that exists in the world. And God, as we'll see, is over all of them in some sense. And we'll clarify and qualify that as we go. So this is going to be a really critical topic. So here's what I want to do today. I don't want you to think just about government today, although we're going to talk a lot about government. Of course, that's what Paul has in his mind. But I want you to think about this bigger than government. I want you to think about the general principle of do I, am I a person that's willing to submit to authorities in my life? Government might be an example, but there's others, right? And so those are key questions for all of us to talk about today. All right, look at that outline in front of you. There's going to be just two simple parts to this. Paul has in Roman numerals 1, we're going to talk about his general exhortation Submit to the governing authorities. We're going to break that down. We're going to talk about what it means, what it doesn't mean, so on. And then on the back, you'll see the second thing is reasons to do this. Paul, one of the things I love about Paul, and Jesus does this too in his own teaching, Paul doesn't just say, I want you to do this. Paul often supplies all kinds of motivations to do it, right? Reasons to do it, arguments. And that's really, we need that, right? It's one thing to just be told, hey, do this. Paul's like, I'm going to tell you to do it. I'm going to tell you what to do, but I'm going to give you the motivations, sort of the, the sort of oomph behind doing it, and that's what he's going to do here. But let's start with the first one. Before we talk about why we're going to do it, let's talk about what we're supposed to do. And Paul, throughout this, it, this chapter, is saying, look, the thing I want to hone on is submission, in this instance, to the government. Now, let's just start with the most obvious question. Why in the world is Paul bringing this up in the book of Romans? This kinda, doesn't this seem a little out of the blue? Let's be honest. Paul's just kind of trucking along Talking about the Christian life, he's laid out his argument for justification by faith. Now he's in the practical application. He's talking about loving each other and being committed to the body of Christ and how you serve and love one another. And suddenly, hey, let me go off on this odd tangent on government. No, it's not an odd tangent. In fact, you know that you already got a little bit of an anticipation of this last week, right? Because one of the things last week he says, you know what marks believers? is the way they endure suffering and persecution from their enemies, and in the back of Paul's mind, he knows he's writing to the church in Rome. And that is a place where the government was very much seriously oppressing the church. So let's just talk about some of the reasons Paul raises this. The first bullet you can see there is it's a practical issue in the lives of those in Rome and on every age. Most of us know that the Roman government was not a fan of Christianity when it came on the scene in the first century. In fact, that's maybe the biggest understatement I could make. Not a fan? Really? Nero actually set Christians on fire in about the mid-60s and lit up the city with them as, a, as, a, as evidence that, that uh, he was going to punish them for what he deemed to be the fires of Rome. He blamed uh, Christians for that. Christians were persecuted by the Roman government in all kinds of ways. The Roman government was not friendly, kind, or nice to believers. Keep in mind that when Paul says submit to the government, he's writing to Romans. He doesn't say submit to a government when you love it and it's all perfect. 
doesn't say submit to a government once you've created the perfect government. Then you can submit to it. No, Paul says submit to the government you have, which he knows what he's saying, even the government in Rome. And here's why. Paul knows that the Roman government was very suspicious of Christians. In other words, Paul knows that the Roman government was always wondering if Christians were insubordinate, whether they were undermining the Roman government. The Roman government viewed Christians as a threat. In fact, I mentioned last week that I'm writing this book on Christianity in the second century. And I've always known this just on an academic level, but I've been struck again by it, how much the Roman government during that time viewed Christians as a serious threat to the whole stability of the Roman Empire. And they were worried that Christians were going to not submit to it. They were really thinking that Christians were going to want to take it over. They were worried about Christians on all kinds of levels because Christians, in some senses, didn't go along with things. And we'll talk about proper times to disobey your government. But the Roman government was very suspicious of Christians. Um, in fact, the language that the Roman government used to describe Christians in the second century is almost exactly like people describe Christians now. There's a quote I put on my website. They describe Christians as haters of humanity. Now, whenever you hear people talk about Christians today as hateful people, you're thinking, wow, is that a new way of talking? Actually, it's a very old way of talking. The Roman government from the very beginning did this. Why is Paul bringing this up? Because you can't escape the reality that you're going to live in a world where there's a government, and you're going to have to interact at some point with how you submit to it. And when you think about this issue, this is so practical for us today because here's the reality. Our government today looks at us with more suspicion than they ever have before. It's really shocking from the inside of the Christian movement. We, we're thinking, just objectively, as I look around the world, Christians are not your big threat, United States of America. Um, we're, we're not the ones that you really have to worry about. This is from our perspective. But that's not the, we know this now, right? The government, is, the laws that are being passed, the things that are being said, that's not true. They're looking at Bible-believing evangelical Christians for whatever set of reasons as an insubordinate group, a threat, uh, a danger to the health of our nation. We hear that and we're thinking, what? But they really believe that. And what I want you to see is the situation we're in right now is exactly the situation Paul was writing to in the first century and second century Rome. And so he brings it up for an obvious reason. This is an issue that's never going to go away. And so if the government looks at you negatively, how do you respond? Rebel? Start a revolution? No, Paul's going to come up with a very different answer to that. Right now, though, I just want you to see this is the first reason Paul brings it up. Let's look at a second reason that Paul brings it up. The second little bullet point there, and I think this is also in the back of his mind, and that is that he knows that Christians are going to tend towards extremes when it comes to the government. This is true today. It's true in the first century. Um, even when Jesus came, what did people want to do? They wanted to usher in the kingdom of God politically, right? They thought, Jesus, we're going to set you up as the next king. By golly, we're going to kick those Romans out of here. We're going to get political revolution, and we're going to set everything right, and that's what we're going to do. And Jesus is like, hold on a second now. You think my kingdom is of this world? No, it's not. I've not come to bring a political revolution. I've come to bring a whole other kingdom entirely. Christians have a propensity to misunderstand government. So look at the two extremes. One extreme is just to reject the legitimacy of government and rebel against it. In other words, one extreme is say, I'm going to throw off the shackles of government, not listen to government, have a revolution against government, and do our own thing. Some people have this sense that they're just going to reject all governing authorities over them. There's a second extreme, though. And I might suggest this one's probably a little more common in our world today, and that is consider government the savior and the solution to all our problems. Those two extremes are pretty interesting, aren't they? One is says, no, government's bad and illegitimate. The other extreme is says, not only is government legitimate, government's the hope. Government's the solution. All you got to do is pass the right laws and everything will be great. These are the two extremes that people fall into. Uh, and what you realize is Paul's, in some sense, addressing the government issue because, you know, it's just inherent in our own minds we're going to go off one of these extremes. And both extremes make the same mistake. You can see how I've written it there is that they both assume that our kingdom is of this world. So either therefore, I've got to either throw off government or I've got to make government the savior, and we assume the kingdom is of this world. By the way, rejecting both those extremes doesn't mean government's illegitimate or doesn't, isn't useful or isn't good. It is all those things. It just means it's neither of those extremes, right? It's not something to be rejected, and it's not something to be used as the ultimate uh, goal. And so Paul knows those things are always a tendency. So he raises this issue probably just because he knows we're always going to have to balance those extremes. But it's the third thing I really want to hone in on there is what I'm convinced Paul raises this for. Paul knows that submission to government is just a subset of the bigger theme of submission. And what I want you to realize today 
is that Paul regards submission to authorities as a mark of a believer. This is something that should characterize you as a Christian. In fact, if you read the Bible and think about the word submit and think about the word subject or whatever, as much as we resist it, the Bible actually talks about it a ton positively. There's all kinds of things we should be submitting to. Parents should submit uh, or uh, <laughs> parents should submit to their children. I got that backwards, didn't I? Um, children should submit to their parents. <clears throat> we should submit to, the, to our church. We should submit to a boss at work. Whatever it happens to be, what we realize is the Bible has all kinds of a litany of things that we're to submit to. And if you read throughout Scripture, you see that ultimately these all lead to the submission of the ultimate thing, which is our submission to God himself. So you can see the key point I put there. Everybody submits to somebody. I tell my students this all the time in the seminar. I was like, if you don't like submission, you just need to think about something for a moment. Everybody submits to somebody. Everybody. It may be a child or their parent. It may be a wife to a husband. We'll cover that issue another day. Uh, it may be you to the government. It may be you to your church, to your boss. Everybody submits to somebody. I'm the president of a seminary. I submit to somebody. I have a board over me that I submit to. Everybody submits to somebody. There is nobody around that is an exception to that rule. And here's the amazing thing. Even Jesus was not an exception to that rule. Time and time again in the Gospels, you know what we're told in a laudable way, and that Jesus himself even says, is that he submits himself to the Father. All that I do, I submit myself to the Father. As soon as you think submission's a bad thing, you know what you've just said? You just said what Jesus has done is a bad thing. If submission's a bad thing, then Jesus is exemplifying a bad trait. No, Jesus himself puts himself in a posture of submission to the authority that's over him. Namely, in his earthly ministry, he submits to the Father himself. Everybody submits to somebody. I have to submit to somebody. You have to submit to somebody. Whatever authority God has placed over your life, in this instance, it's government, you have to submit to it. This is the mark of a believer. And here's the key. If I, so, if I see a person that professes to be a believer and they're rejecting every human authority in their life, and then they're saying, yes, but I'm loyal to God, I'm like, you have misunderstood your Christian life. First of all, you've misunderstood your heart. If you have a heart that's that rebellious, that every single authority that's put over you, you reject, suddenly your heart's compliant when it comes to God? How naive is that? Here's the thing you should be looking for. If you're a person who willingly submits to God, you should see that exemplified in other places too. If the only place you say you submit is to God and not to other places, and you have a very narrow part of your life here that you've carved out, I submit narrowly to God, but every other authority I reject. No, that's, that's not what God's calling us to. He's calling us to use that characteristic in all the proper places in our life where we have authorities over us. Now, again, there's a lot of qualifications to this. I'm going to get to those in a moment. But right now, I want you to understand a basic biblical principle we may not have thought of is that submission is good. And Paul is addressing this issue with the government because he wants us to realize that should be something that marks every Christian. Now, once we have this issue in play here in terms of why Paul brings it up or kind of why it matters, look at uh, part B there. What does submission actually mean? Now, Here's where we get the rubber hits the road, right? So it's one thing to say you submit. What does submit mean? Now, we could talk about this for a long time. There's lots of different nuances, but I want to help you think about submission sort of in two categories. Submission has to do with disposition, and it has to do with action, okay, both. It has to do with disposition, and it has to do with action. Look down at the passage, and you'll see uh, both of these things laid out in the text. And again, we're not going to go through this chronologically, but Paul, in the very first verse, says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. That's his opening line. And then he defines it later, both as a disposition and an action. Disposition can be seen in verse 7. Uh, oh, if you owe reverence, uh, or sorry, respect to whom respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. Notice that Paul defines submission here not just simply as something you do, but as a disposition of your heart an attitude. It's an attitude of respect. I want you to think about your kids for a moment. When you ask your children to submit to you, are you hoping that they just technically follow your orders? And they, when you say clean your room, that they robotically walk up and clean their room? No, what you're looking for is also a heart that actually respects you, right, and honors you. So half of disposition is an attitude of the heart. It's, it's uh, half of submission, sorry, is an attitude of a heart. It's a disposition towards those in authority to, uh, over us that shows them respect 
and honor. But it's also a do thing. It's also an action thing. And Paul has a whole bunch of these um, uh, uh, that he lists throughout uh, his verses. So verse 3, uh, he says, do what is good uh, for the government. Down in verse 5, this is, uh, he says, um, therefore, you must be in subjection uh, to the government. Uh, and then verse 7 is the most painful one. Uh, pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed. Who groaned when we read that, right? Uh, I think I might have actually heard some audible groans when we read that. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. This is tax season too. You know, it's like the timing of this passage is amazing. Uh, revenue to whom revenue is owed, etc. So there's two halves of submission to a government, and it's simple. You have honor and respect for the government, and you obey its laws. That's what submission is. Or to put it another way, you have a heart that respects the authority over you, and you do what it tells you. Okay? Now, that applies to other authorities, too, not just government, right? Is that's how you submit. If you want to know how to submit to authority, you respect them, and you obey them. If there's a police officer that you need to submit to, you show respect, and you obey them. If there's a teacher that you need to submit to, I tell my kids, you should submit to your teacher, respect and obey. On and on, whatever authorities God has given our lives, these are the categories. Now, once that's laid out, there's a bunch of clarifications that need to be mentioned here because I know what's on your mind. You're like, but what about this? What about that? What about this qualification? And they're all true. All these things need to be laid out. But we don't want to start with the exceptions, do we? You want to start with the principle and then come to the exceptions. But the exceptions I have at the bottom of your page there, look down at the bottom and you'll see. There's several little qualifications, or what I'm calling clarifications, that I want to go into here. They're going to help you understand what subjection to the government really means and doesn't mean. So here's a bunch of doesn't means. Let's just look at them one at a time. First, submission doesn't mean you always agree with the government. This is not Paul saying, whatever the government says, or whatever its policies are, you have to say those are great policies, and you have to agree with those. That's not what submission is. Submission is respect and obey but not necessarily agreement. You can disagree, and you can disagree vigorously with the government, and that is not an inappropriate mode of talk here. In fact, there's, there's examples in the Bible of people who've disagreed with the behavior of governing authorities. Can anyone think of one? There's several. Examples in Scripture where someone disagrees with the governing authority or points out what they deem to be a problem or an issue with it. What's that? Where? Where? Yeah, Paul, there's actually a several st stories in the book of Acts where Paul actually goes to the governing authorities and complains about the way they're treating Christians. In other words, here's something that your policies are not right, okay? And we actually have examples in the second century of Christian apologists doing a ton of this. They'll go to the government and they'll make an appeal. Your policies are wrong, they're not accurate, they're not fair, and you need, you know, and they disagree, okay? Who else could think of an example? Okay, that kind of is one, although it's sort of wartime example, really. Ah, interestingly. Okay, so th there's not so much disagreement, but disobedience. And we'll come back to the disobedience thing. You know, one of the examples of, of disagreement I, I'm thinking of is John the Baptist, who, who confronted Herod's adultery. Think about this. Here's Herod, the king of, of Israel, and he ends up taking his brother's wife. I can't forget exactly what the scenario was. He ends up committing adultery. And John the Baptist says, well, I don't have to stay silent about that. In fact, on the contrary, I'm going to call out Herod and tell him it's wrong. So what John the Baptist do? He basically stands up as a prophet and says, you should not have another man's wife. You're committing adultery. Now, is that a violation of submission to the government? No, you can disagree with your government, and you can point out where the government's wrong, and that's exactly what John the Baptist did. And, of course, we all know the, how that ended. Ended up being beheaded for it. Look at a second qualification here. Submission doesn't mean you cannot work to change the government. As I mentioned a moment ago, in the early centuries of the faith, Christians were making appeals all the time to the government, saying, change your policies. Uh, and they would work to see policies change. They'd work to see laws change. We're busy working to see laws change, aren't we? And I imagine in this election season, that's probably one of the things you're thinking about as you vote, is that there, there's things going on right now that are, that are flat out wrong in our government. Things that are now, some things not only wrong, but some are just unwise, some are just inefficient. There's all kinds of things we might want to change in our government right, and the way they approach the sanctity of life, for example, and want to see that changed, that's entirely legitimate. That is not an example of a violation of submitting to your government. Submitting to your government doesn't mean you never work to change it. You can, through lawful means, work to change your government. Look at a third example here of a doesn't. 
Submission doesn't mean you must sin if the government asks you to. This is the big one. People say, I'm supposed to submit my government. What if they, what if they ask me to sin? And the answer is, if they ask you to sin, you don't sin. If the government asks you to do something sinful, then you pick God over men. So this is a very important qualification. Paul knows these qualifications in the back of his mind. He doesn't have to offer them all because he offers them, first of all, in other places. And secondly, we have the larger biblical witness that lays this out. Let's think about it for a moment. What are some examples you know, and they came up a little bit already, of people in the Bible who, who actually disobeyed the government when the government asked them to sin? So, yep. Ah, there's a great example. Egyptian government says to the Hebrew midwives, when a baby boy comes out, you kill it. Would that be a sinful thing? Yeah, yes, okay. And should you obey that government law? No, and they didn't. That's a great example. I heard another one over here. No, not at all, not a stretch at all. In fact, even with, on the topic of Daniel, I think that even the more clear example is when they said you should no longer pray to the God of Israel, and this is the new law. And what did Daniel do immediately in that story? I love this. It's like, hey, new law, I want you to know you can't pray to God of Israel. And Daniel's like, hold on, I'll be right back. <laughs> okay, you could think of that as another example of someone who says, look, I'm going to submit to you, government, up until you ask me to sin. Okay? Now, there's lots of laws we may disagree with that don't cause us to sin. But if ever the government says, go do this act, and it's a sinful act, your obligation is actually to reject the government at that point and to not obey. So Paul's not talking about blind submission here. Okay? He knows there's these important qualifications. for any. And by the way, that's true for any authority, right? For any authority that you submit to, if they ask you to sin, you say no. Okay? There's other examples we could talk about here. The one example always comes to my, my mind in the early chapters of Acts when Peter and John were pulled before the authorities. We know this, right? And they said, stop preaching about Jesus. We're ordering you. And they're like, and they even said in that passage, you're asking us to choose between God and men, and that's not going to go your way, right? We're going to go with God on that one. And they left the governing authorities and went out and did what? They preached about Jesus. There's people, even in the last year, I'm not going to go through them all, all examples, who've stood up to our government when the government's asked them to sin. And by the way, in our Constitution, there's clauses in our government for, for, for the right of the conscience. If you, you work for the government, or you are part of the government, or you're just a citizen and the government says you have to do this and you think it's a sin, you have the right of conscience to say, I'm not going to do that. And we know stories in the last year where people got thrown in jail for that. That's not what Paul's talking about here. When he's saying submit to the government, he doesn't say there's never a time to disobey. Of course there is if the government asks you to do what you deem to be sinful. We could go on and on in examples here. One last qualification. Submission doesn't mean there can never be a justifiable war against a government. This is a big issue we're not going to uncover today. But people always ask me, what about the American Revolution? Was that a violation of submission to the government? You probably don't realize this. There's a big theological debate out there about that issue. You're thinking, wow, I didn't even know these things existed, right? But there's a whole category called just war theory about when is it right to actually go to war with the government. And we're not going to get into that today. What I want you to understand, though, is I think the Bible does lay out parameters for just war, okay? If that, that is not a violation of submission to government. Sometimes governments become so evil and so egregious that there's times to actually go in just war against them. It's not our job here to unpack that. This list of qualifications is simply to make a point. When Paul says submit to authorities, it's not a blind, stupid, irrational submission, but he's ser very serious about submitting, uh, even with those qualifications in mind. And that applies, of course, to authorities beyond just governing ones. So our whole first Roman numeral was simple here. Paul's main exhortation is submit. We've asked why he brought it up. Why does it matter? What does it mean? What does it not mean? But there's still this big issue floating around out there is that we all need to still do it. And to do it, we need motivation. So flip your notes over, and you'll see that Paul gives plenty of it here in our uh, discussion. Lots of good motivation here that uh, Paul gives. He's going to give three big ones in the text. Uh, that I think are going to help lay out sort of a theology of submission, okay, uh, or motivation for submission. And I want you to think about this when you pay your taxes. You're probably going to really need this when you pay your taxes, right? But I want you to think about this when you think about other authorities in your life. 
that you submit to. So let's just walk through these reasons to submit. Paul lays out three. I'll look at them all at once for a moment. First, all authorities come from God. Therefore, submitting to authorities is submitting to God. Second, this authority has a good purpose. In this instance, government. And then thirdly, rejecting that authority, in this instance, government, has negative consequences. Incidentally, you could take those same three principles and apply it to other authorities. Let's imagine we were talking to children obeying their parents. I could say the same three things. A, your parents are an authority set up by God. B, your parent, parenting has a good purpose. You need them. And then three, if you reject your parents' authority, there's negative consequences, right? <laughs> All kinds of negative consequences. You see what I mean? Any authority could be plugged in here. The point is, these are the three principles that Paul is laying out. Let's just digest them one at a time. First, all authorities come from God. And this may blow your mind, but it's very important for you to get it. Paul is saying, look, if God is sovereign over all things, then all human authorities are, are put up by him. Look at verse 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. This is an amazing statement. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Paul's making it very plain here that if an authority exists, it exists under his sovereign plan. Does that mean God endorses everything that authority does? Of course not. Does that mean that authority is godly? Not in this instance. The Romans were very ungodly. But it does mean this. That God is so sovereign that you can trust if providentially an authority is over you in your life that it's appointed by God and deserves to be submitted to by you with the appropriate qualifications we've already laid out. This is a really key principle, and it flows directly out of God's sovereignty. And you know what? Paul's already made this point in the book of Romans. You may not, you may not have even remembered it, but remember what he said about Pharaoh? God says, don't you realize I'm the one that raised up Pharaoh? Don't you, want, don't you realize I'm the one that made him king and then made him stubborn so that I could accomplish my purposes? Pharaoh's leadership was directly under the sovereign control of God. In fact, what, what the amazing point is, when we talked about Romans 9 and Pharaoh, remember the conclusion we reached, which is really important, is don't assume when wicked authorities take roles that somehow God's losing. Sometimes wicked authorities step up, and it's exactly what God has intended in his sovereign plan. He has a plan, and part of it is he's using these wicked authorities as an instrument to, to govern his world for his ends, and sometimes we don't always see what those ends are, but he's already made the point here is that he controls all authorities. He had Pharaoh go up and Pharaoh brought down. He brings the authority in your life up. He brings the authority in your life down. If you have a boss you love, he brought it up. Or if you have a boss you don't like, it's still under him because God is sovereign over all. In fact, notice the language Paul uses in verses 4 and 6 here. In verse 4, he says that the authorities of the government are God's servant. Think about how mind-blowing this would be for Romans, for the people who lived in Rome. The Roman government is God's servant? They're wicked. They're terrible. They're awful. But Paul doesn't mean when he says they're God's servant that they do all the things God wants. What he means is that God, by his providential control, determines what authorities exist in the world. And inasmuch as an authority over you, it's God's servant and uh, God's extension over you. Verse four, he calls them ministers of, I'm sorry, verse six, he calls them ministers of God. Another language that seems shocking. Here's what I want you to realize is that all authorities that God has over you are given by him ultimately. So let's think about some other authorities in your life for a moment. We're talking about government. What are some other ones you're going to have to submit to? And there's a whole bunch of answers to this. Okay. Do you submit to the elders in your church? That's an authority over you. Okay. And actually, that backs it up a couple of lessons. Are you even part of a church, right? Uh, it's easy to say, well, I don't have to worry about submitting to a church because I don't go to one, right? <laughs> or I'm not a member of one. Well, then that's a back, you got to back up to that problem, solve that problem. And then once you get to a church, submit yourself to the elders of it. What other authorities are in your life that you need to submit to? Your boss. If you work, you have a boss. You need to submit to that boss. He may be a great boss, maybe a terrible boss. You need to submit to that boss. And what does submit mean? Respect and listen to what they say. But it doesn't mean always agree. It doesn't mean you can't work to change. It doesn't mean you do something if they say you should sin. All the appropriate qualifications, but a boss is an authority. What other authorities? Yeah. Paul is very clear in other passages about the relationship between husbands and wives, and he calls wives to submit to husbands. That's a, that's a big topic I'm not going to get into now, uh, but he, he lays it out in Ephesians 5, and he lays it out in a number of other spots. Peter picks it up in 1 Peter 3. You've got to look at that as well. Other examples? 
for us, it may be the, uh, you know, the proximate governing authorities, like a police officer. If you're in a class, you're a teacher. You know, think about what you tell your kids. When you tell your kids and then they go into the world, you tell them, buck off every authority around? No, you say, listen to your teachers. Do what they tell you, right? Listen to the authorities that God places over you. This is the mark of a believer with the appropriate qualifications I've already laid out. Here's why. Notice what Paul says in verse 2. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist that will incur judgment, implication from God. Here's what I want to ask you today. You knew this question was coming. And here it is. What authority in your life right now are you not submitting to? It's a good question to ask, isn't it? And I don't ask that just to you. I ask that to me. What authority in my life am I submitting to or not submitting to? And then I need to repent of that and really start living out what God has called me to do in that area. It might be the government. Fair enough, right? Maybe you're cutting corners on your taxes. Who knows what's going on? Maybe it is the government. But maybe it's something else. Maybe it's a boss. Maybe it's your husband. Maybe it's another authority in your life. Ask the question, is there authority in my life that I am not submitting to? And realize that when you do that, the person you're actually rejecting is God's authority over you. Now, here's what I tell parents all the time. We t- M- Melissa and I teach a parenting class at our church at Uptown, and we teach it about every other year, and we just try to help parents, you know, raise their kids and work through all the difficulties of disciplining their children. It's tough stuff. But one of the things I tell parents all the time is that what you're doing as a parent is you're asking your child to submit to you, right? And it's a good biblical thing you're asking them to do, and you shouldn't Stop doing that. You should ask your child to submit to you. That's what God asks. But I'm going to ask a second question, parents. Do you submit to the authorities that you're under? Think about it for a moment. What if you were telling your kid all the time, listen to me, listen to me, and then they watch your life, and you buck every single authority in your life? What is the, ch- what is the child's lesson that they're really learning? Is that you just fake like there's authorities in your life and that you can just you know, talk bad about them behind their back and disrespect them and then buck up under them. And that's what I should do to you, mom and dad. Here's the amazing thing, is that if we're going to ask people in our lives to submit to us, maybe the example I just gave is our children, then we've got to ask, are we submitting to the places that God has put us in? Right? Here's the thing. Submission is hard. It is not easy. I've got to submit to people in my work. It's not easy to do. Maybe I disagree with them. Maybe they're not a good boss. Who knows? The point is, it's not easy. The point is that that's what marks a sanctified believer is that they submit even in tough situations, even under non-ideal authorities, that's when you can say, ah, there's something different about that person. Think about what the world does. Does the world exemplify submission? No. This is what Paul wants you to see, is that if you're going to be a believer, this should be different about you. You should be able to to look at a believer's life and note, ah, something is different here about this whole person's disposition to the things of the world. So this is A number one, right? You want motivation? Motivation is that you're doing this for God. Submit to the authority that's over you as unto the Lord, okay? Almost as if, and really in some sense it is if, God is the one you're submitting to. You want a hard time submitting to your boss? Think about it. When I do that, I'm really submitting to God. Let God be the motivation for the submission that you have to have. All right, let's look at a second motivation here that Paul lays out, and that is this authority, first, it's from God. Secondly, it's actually a good authority, meaning it has a good purpose, and is, you know, terrible as the Roman government was in many levels, Paul lays out it, the case for why government is good. Look at verse 4. Paul says, uh, really back up to verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who's in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. And listen to this line. This is the key. For he, the governing authority, is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. And this is a very fascinating thing about God's purpose for government, by the way. What's God's purpose for government? As an extension of his own justice. Why does the government bear the sword? And by, by the term sword here, Paul means the ability to, you know, execute people, put people to death, to, you know, punish the wicked, throw people in jail, or however you want to conceive of it. He's saying, why does the government have that authority? Because they are doing God's work when they punish evil. If you reject government, what Paul is saying is you're actually rejecting something that the world needs, something to restrain evil. 
Here's what I want you to realize that I think is pretty fascinating about this passage. And, I, and I, when I told you it's not really about how government works, it's really about our response to it, that's true. 95% of this passage is really about our general response to government, not how government should be, so to speak. But it is interesting that Paul does lay out this principle of what government should be. And I'm convinced that Paul is laying out here a biblical principle about the core role of government. And I want you to notice how limited it is. Paul's understanding here of the core role of government, it's not an exhaustive list. Surely he would acknowledge the government does other things. But the main role of government is to restrain evil and protect its citizens. Number one goal of government. Restrain evil, protect its citizens. That's why it bears the sword. He, now, even though this is a not, a not an exhaustive list necessarily of all that Paul thinks government should do, it is noteworthy that this is the main thing he mentions. And I think it is also worth thinking about our own governing system and whether that's our government's main role or is it being done as its main role. And we as Christians can look at our governmental systems or people's own policies and say, well, look, at least I know on a biblical level the main goal of government from, a, from the perspective of Paul's at least is that it protect the citizens restrain evil, and punish evildoers. Is our government doing that? And I think that's a whole conversation for another day, right? Is it doing that well, doing that bad? I don't, you know, I'm not going to get into that, but I think we can, we can at least realize that's a key question to ask about any government, and Paul lays that out. So his point is simply this. Why should you obey the government? First, because it's really God who you're obeying, and secondly, because this is an important institution. This institution matters. Now, once you have that principle in mind, you can plug in any authority. Why should you obey your teacher? Because that institution matters. Teachers are important. Why should you obey your parents? Because that institution matters. That institution's important. You could plug in any authority, and if it's set up by God, which is what the first point is, then you realize that's an institution that has benefit for you. Here's what we train our children when they submit to authorities. We tell them, you should submit, that submit to that authority because it has benefit for you. Your parents have benefit for you. The government has benefit for you. doesn't mean it's perfect. doesn't mean your parents are perfect. But it has a good role. And so if you need motivation to submit to your government today, as sort of frustrating as ours is, Paul's laying it out. You've got to have a government. You've got to have something that restrains evil. So you don't want to rebel against it. If you rebel against it, you're actually rebelling against something that has a good purpose as an extension of God's own justice. Make no mistake about it. When the government pub punishes an evildoer and a wicked person, that is an extension of God's justice on that person. Commit a crime, you get punished. You could see that as an extension of God's own justice on those individuals. Third thing for our motivation here, and this is really key, of course, is if you reject government, Paul's just really plain about this, you're going to have to reap the consequences. Um, and there's two consequences here. First of all, the government's own consequence, right? We already read it in verse 4. Uh, he, he's, he bears the sword. Why do you want to be on the receiving end of that? If you reject the government and you get punished by the government, you don't have my sympathy, says Paul. <laughs> He's like, look, if you're going to reject governing authorities and then they punish you, well, yeah, that's the consequence. But here's what's interesting. If Paul doesn't just say you're going to have punishment from the civil authorities if you reject them, he actually says you'll have punishment from God if you reject them. Look down in verse 5 again. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. Did you get that? If you don't obey the government, not only are you subject to the government's punishment, but God's punishment. Let this sink in for a moment. That is how seriously God takes human authorities over us. So serious, in fact, that when we buck them and reject them and ignore them, that God's wrath can come on us. Now, when it says God's wrath can come on us here, it's not talking about as an unbeliever eternally, right? It's talking about proximate punishments that God disciplines even those he loves. But he can. He can say, look, if you're going to reject the authorities in your life, there's consequences, not only from those authorities, but from me right? So take the, the, ch the child parent example again. What would you tell a child if they rebel against their parents? What are the consequences? The consequences, well, you might get disciplined by your parents, right? And if your parents put on some harsh discipline on you, that can be really painful. But when you tell children to submit to their parents, you're not saying only because your parents might discipline you. You tell children to submit to their parents because God also might discipline you. Children don't realize that when they reject their parents' authority, that they're not only subject to their parents' disapproval, they're subject to God's disapproval. So Paul's laying out the good motives here for you. You want to be motivated? Paul's saying, I'm going to give you a, a negative motivation. You can avoid being punished both by government and by God if you submit properly to the authorities that God 
has put over you. God takes that seriously. Why? Because he set them up. They reflect his authority. He's sovereign over all the world. They have good purposes. And when you reject all that, you're basically saying, I know better than God. What does God know anyway? And know what you realize that's happening in your heart? The very visceral rejection of authority that you do for humans, you're actually now doing to God. Ah, what is this? What does my teacher know? What does my boss know? What an idiot. You know, my parents were fools. What do they know? They don't know how the world works. And pretty soon, you know what? You start talking about God like that. What does God know? What does he think he's doing? He doesn't know how the world works. You know, when someone tells authorities on a human level those things, you realize that that's in your heart. And if it's in your heart, you think it just disappears when you start interacting with God? Suddenly you're, you're, you're miscompliant? No, Paul's point here is clear. Submission should mark the believer in all the proper areas of our life, precisely because that's the same thing that allows us to submit to God in heaven. Don't think you can carve out God as an exception to every other rule in your life. Reject every other authority, but somehow keep God. It doesn't work that way. So this is a real, real important text for us to take away. So my big exhortation for you as you think about this passage and you digest it is the same one I'm giving myself, which is how am I doing submitting to human authorities? And what is that telling me about my heart? And what is that telling me about my relationship with God? Now, granted, there's all the caveats we listed. Sometimes you have a human authority that's wicked and asks you to sin. Of course you don't obey. Those sorts of things are always in the background here. But I don't want you to think about all the exceptions, right? I want you to focus on the reality of where are our hearts when it comes to submission. If Christ could submit to the Father, then surely we can submit. Submission's a good thing, a thing that marks all believers. So this is a tough one today, I know. Tough for me, tough for you, but a, but a really good one, one that pushes us, challenges us, maybe in whole new ways you never thought of when you think about the Christian life. Paul's big summation then is that you Romans, may the government look at you and not see a threat, May they may still anyway, even despite your good things, but at least may you have a clean conscience that you've obeyed the government despite their persecution of you. All right, a lot to talk about in our groups. So let's do that. Let's transition to those groups. And I'm sure you all have a, a bunch of interesting little takeaways from this in those times. Let me pray for us as we transition. Lord, we, we're grateful for this teaching, tough teaching today, Lord. But we, we admit we're just not very good at submitting. Truth, truth be told, we're kind of lousy at it. But Lord, you can change our hearts. Help us all to submit the authorities in our life, whatever they may be, as we submit unto you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.